Hello everyone, this is Hillary with Dominion Tea, and today we're going to talk about the history of tea in Japan. Now, Japan's got a long history that is well documented, um, so we could be here a very long time if I got into all the details. Instead, what I've done is put um, references for you to go dig on your own in the show notes uh, if anything piques your curiosity and you want to learn more about it. But in the meantime, let's take you through a brief history. So tea really starts to surface in Japan during the 8th century CE. This is due to a cultural exchange uh, between the Japanese and the Chinese via Buddhist monks. Now that is hugely important because as we travel up to modern day, the traditions of Buddhism uh, very much color how the tea industry works in Japan, how the Japanese approach tea production and growth, as well as the Japanese tea ceremony uh, that most of us uh, in other parts of the world are very familiar with. And so you see throughout history um, that it is the Buddhists that really influence how tea is made, presented and consumed in Japan. They are also the ones that get the credit for really documenting first, um, before science could catch up in the 1900s, the health benefits of tea. Uh, and that is always kind of a fascinating um, thought that all the way back in the 12th uh, century, uh, humans already had a sense for just how healthy this beverage was. So let's talk about some of the traditions. So we get to credit two of these monks, uh, Issei and Sinoriku, for really driving the traditions behind tea. Um, they are the ones that brought back, of course, it came in powdered form in the eighth century and remained that way. Uh, the Chinese also taught the monks uh, how to steam the tea to stop oxidation. Now here's the irony of it. After uh, Isek returns to Japan, the Japanese and Chinese stop talking to each other. And the Japanese continue steaming tea and keep that tradition as their primary way to stop oxidation. And so they become exceedingly good at producing green tea. And this is really um, your start of matcha and its tradition continues. So the Buddhists would prepare the matcha before they sat through meditation. And your Japanese tea ceremony comes from that routine and that kind of preparation for contemplation in life in a very serene and simple environment. Uh, and it also drove the creation of pottery. So some people may be uh, familiar with Roku pottery. Uh, it has a certain glaze. You will find it very routinely on matcha bowls. And so, but that was absolutely driven uh, by the Buddhist monks and by tea itself. And so that is kind of a funny influence you get to see. Of course, the Japanese uh, philosophy of using everything uh, it comes into tea, even in the modern age, through mechanization. So uh, most people won't appreciate that kukicha from Japan is actually the tea stem. And so when they harvest in a mechanized fashion, they have to cut everything. They're not plucking the individual leaves. So they have this leftover stem. And kukicha is that stem being steamed to stop oxidation as well and cut down to a uniform size and turned into tea. So it's a true reflection of kind of Japanese philosophy and the Buddhist philosophy of nothing going to waste. The other thing uh, that hasn't been maintained through the Buddhist traditions all the way back to that 8th century is maintaining the healthy qualities of the tea. And that comes in how the Japanese have worked on various cultivars uh, to help ensure that the tea survives uh, both disease, insect infestations originally, and now climate change. And finally, their farming practices, which we'll touch on here in a moment. So there are several tea growing regions in Japan, but quite frankly, originally in those first several centuries, you'd find most of the tea around Kyoto, uh, as well as a couple of the larger Buddhist shrines further south. Uh, and it expanded over time as the industry grew and as various regions, especially under the Shogun Empire, wanted to take on tea and adopt tea into their culture and the emperor wanted them to have it. 
And so it spread across the country at that point and has remained that way. Now, it's sometimes uh, kind of hard to remember. Japan is a string of islands, and mainly a string of dormant volcanoes. So it is a high elevation place. And so most of those growing regions are absolutely mountainside. Um, a lot of them are close to a mile high, if not higher, uh, which is the perfect place for tea to grow. So tea has thrived in this country for a very long time. So let's talk about current trends so you know what's going on. Uh, Japan is very worried about preserving its history, both at home and with its expats abroad. Uh, this is around the tea ceremony, around matcha, around the art and the aesthetic. And so there are plenty of associations, and we've put a link to one in our show notes, where you can go and learn how to perform the tea ceremony. Now, you don't have to be Japanese uh, to enroll in the class, but you can learn about the tea ceremony, how to perform it, uh, Japanese calligraphy, flower arranging, uh, and even Japanese art and music. So it is a beautiful way um, through this association internationally for the Japanese to kind of preserve their history and ensure that it continues to move forward. They're also working on a single cultivar sencha. And what I mean by that is around the 1960s and 70s, Japan got a humongous um, kind of a double hit of both an insect invasion that was wiping out the tea plant as well as a fungus invasion. And so they had to start about trying to build um, multiple cultivars to endure through this, which they did successfully. And so they went into a real diversity. And so a tea field would have several different cultivars intermingled in order to stop the, the um, fungus infection and deter the insects. And what they uh, stuck with with that was, okay, we have this great diversity, but they lost that kind of single cultivar. And they're returning to that in certain subfields and producing single cultivar sinchas and learning to differentiate the flavor in those sinchas, which is a lot of fun to play with. And then the Japanese always have it. They have brought very much to the forefront uh, chakusaba, which is sustainable farming. And what they're doing in these tea fields is in between the rows of the tea plants, they are growing uh, Japanese native grass. Uh, this is both one of those things where they can cut the grass and all of a sudden it becomes mulch and food for the tea plant. Uh, it also kind of helps, quite frankly, with the flavor. You can completely tell the difference between tea that has been raised in a field uh, with this type of farming versus tea that has not. The flavor is much more complex. And last but not least, Japan makes black tea. No, most of us in the United States are shocked to find that out. Uh, but the industry has been there since uh, the mid-1900s. It's just not very large. It is consumed in country usually or exported into Russia. Uh, and, but quite frankly, they're trying to expand it. And so we'll, we'll hold out some hopes that we'll find some here in the U.S. sometime soon. As we kind of look forward, Japan is also kind of going to be home to the first robots plucking tea. Um, a lot of the robotic companies, both in Japan and Korea, are using the Japanese tea fields to test out artificial intelligence and the capability of a robot to actually harvest a plant like tea um, by hand. So actually plucking it. Uh, what you've got here in the picture, of course, is the current mechanized method that the Japanese use in order to harvest. Uh, they're also using the robots and testing uh, the AI to see when they can determine plant growth. And when it is time to harvest and tea makes it a, a pretty hardy plant and an easier plant because they already know it's harvesting season to test robots on and actually doing a harvest production. As I mentioned earlier, the Japanese are also expanding uh, black tea and hope to, to be exporting that soon out to the rest of the world. And last but not least, they are ramping up their single cultivar offerings, both of Sincha. Uh, I have actually seen some bunch as well, as they uh, try to uh, differentiate their green teas for the ones coming out from other countries. So we hope you enjoyed this tiny little bit of Japanese tea history, uh, and it encourages you to go explore. We hope you enjoyed learning more about tea with us. Hit the subscribe button so that you can be notified when we add more videos to our channel. And check out the highlighted videos to learn even more about tea. And last but not least, you can check out all of the teas we talk about in our videos at dominiontea.com.